Hi, I'm Ral Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. Today, I'm kind of talking to you in both guises. First, I'm just going to be the CEO of Real Vision. And then after that, I'm going to swap hats and have my global macro investor hat. As you know, Real Vision itself doesn't have a, have a view, but I do personally, and my research service does. We've been going through an extraordinary year. It's something we knew that we were probably headed towards a recession, and at Real Vision, we'd covered that well in advance. And then COVID came, and COVID was the big change. Now, since that happened, certain things have happened that most people would never have expected to see, and other things are as expected. And we're all trying to scramble with the idea has everything changed? What does this all mean? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for you? And that's a really complicated question. You know, whether it's the move of people out of cities to the countryside, whether it's the bifurcation of the markets with the biggest tech names racing ahead and other names being left behind, the passive versus active flows. There's so many of the themes we've touched on in Real Vision that are kind of all at the big question mark, has this changed? And I think it's really important for us in the biggest economic event of our lifetimes to try and figure this out because it has real impacts. It's going to impact our jobs. It's going to impact our trading and investing. It's going to impact our pensions and it's going to impact our futures. So that's why this is important. That's why we've set up two weeks of campaign for you to understand, get all of the nuances from this. So what do I think, Raoul Pal of Global Macro Investor? Well, if you remember, I started this journey back in February and March talking about something called the unfolding. The unfolding is how I thought my hypothesis or thesis of how this will play out. Look, none of us own the truth here. None of us have a crystal ball. We're just trying to use an investment framework. So my investment framework was this was going to be a three-phase affair. The first phase of the unfolding was going to be the liquidation phase. And that came to pass. So by March, I had been short. I'd been long bonds. And into the end of March, I closed out all of those trades. The reason being is that the Fed were going to come in and provide massive liquidity into this liquidity event. The markets froze. Everything shut down. The Fed came in, record amounts of stuff, and then fiscal stimulus to paper over the cracks. The next phase that I said that that would usher in was called the hope phase. The hope phase is very typical in extended bear markets or recessions. It's the part when everybody thinks, you know what, it's going to be all right. The Fed have got our backs. The government's got our backs. That period can go on for some time. So I've looked at the past. The longest one of these was 1929, and that went on from six months. Then 2001, which bottomed in March and peaked in June, looks very similar to now, and I'll come on to that why in a sec. 2008, bottomed in March, peaked in June. The Nikkei 1990, bottomed in March, peaked in June. What's interesting is that many of the markets peaked in June. Many of the subsectors peaked in June. So June, things changed. And my idea behind that was stimulus was going to start running off. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important. Is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1 to get a month's access to this incredible treasure trove. I don't think you can afford to be without it. And the economy will have done its best up until then. And then we were going to go into the period where we may not have all of the stimulus. And that too has come to pass. 
Now, what did I get wrong? I didn't expect the NASDAQ to be at all-time highs or the S&P 500. But when I dig beneath it, there's a different story that's being told. There's a sub-narrative. And that sub-narrative, I think, is the rise of the insolvency phase. And that's the next phase of my thesis. And I think it's going to play out. So that dichotomy, people call it the K-shaped recovery or the K-shaped market, where you've seen banks and you've seen tech stocks doing the opposite. I think that is the false narrative that people are following. People are saying, well, these tech stocks, they're just being treated by long, like long-term bonds. And I don't think that's the case. I think to deal with those names first, just at a superficial level, I think it's been driven by passive flows, by the 401k buying by millennials. Because most people, yes, people are losing jobs, but there was stimulus. And those who have jobs have continued to invest in the marketplace. That skewing of returns in an illiquid market drive those names higher. Then the checks that were given out turned into rampant speculation. And we've seen brokerage accounts open across the United States as younger people started participating in markets and trading their favorite narratives, which happened to be the same tech names that were in their 401ks. We've seen option volumes at all-time record highs. In fact, option volumes outstripping the volumes of the underlying stocks. And these are all in small odd lots for individual retail investors. We also saw SoftBank coming in, spending billions of dollars in premium on speculative option activity. So these things all built on that narrative. But I don't think it's the narrative of what's really going on. What's really going on, I think, is starkly told by the spread between gold miners or even gold itself and the banks. At one point a couple of weeks ago, that spread was 85%. And that's in eight months. 85% difference between the banks and the gold miners tells you something significant. And when you scratch away at the market, it's starting to tell you a story of insolvency. So what is this insolvency story? Why do I get this idea? Surely everything's okay. Everything's gone back to normal. But that's not the case. So if I show you the Jeffries real-time economic data series, the US and Europe and most countries in the world saw that kind of inverse tick or square root where it came down, it bounced, and then it's flatlined. Now that's interesting because it's flatlining global growth somewhere around negative three to negative 5%. So right now, we're still in the biggest recession of our lifetimes, and this is after the recovery from the, from the initial lockdowns. So what we're facing is the economic reality. Now, could it gradually trend higher? Well, it's certainly doing that. And if it would continue to do that, we wouldn't be out of recession until well into next year, maybe next summer, maybe even longer. But if I'm right that the insolvency phase is going to come, then this could go on longer. And again, I don't think necessarily the economy needs to get worse, but just not recover. And that's the real issue here. It's all about time. So to explain what that means, think about if you have a mortgage payment due on your house and you've lost your job, you might have some savings to pay that mortgage. So you last a few months. Maybe you can figure out another loan, borrow some money from your parents or whatever it may be. So you scrape through. But after a while, if your income has fallen, or maybe you get a new job, but your job doesn't pay as much and you can't pay your mortgage, over time, your probability of default exponentially rises. That's an insolvency. Insolvencies happen insidiously, slowly, miserably, bit by bit. That Ernest Hemingway quote is, how did you go bankrupt slowly and then all at once? And I think that's how insolvencies play out. So I'm worried that, the, that US GDP and global GDP is going to say negative much longer than almost anybody expects. That's kind of borne out also by 
what we can see with stimulus. Stimulus is pretty much paused in most places right now. It's becoming increasingly difficult to pass anything in the US before the election. They will put something through. They might try and give some checks. But the mar markets look at the marginal rate of change, and the marginal rate of change of stimulus is falling. The central bank, having done their job with liquidity, doesn't have much of a job to do. I mean, the credit markets are all in tax because they basically supported them. So there's no free market in credit any longer. So that's off their books. They've also made sure that everyone has enough liquidity for the time being. So the worst borrowers, whether it's globally by the swap lines or internally, have some access. And the governments with their loans as well and the Fed loans have allowed people to paper over the cracks for the time being. But as that starts petering away and the negative growth goes on, it becomes harder for everybody. It becomes harder for sovereign nations like Turkey, Brazil, Argentina to continue to cover their debt loads. It becomes difficult for households where maybe they've lost their jobs. It's difficult to then cover your rent. Well, if your rent goes, then maybe your landlord defaults on his mortgage. It's harder to pay your credit card bills. Don't forget, credit card rates are all-time record highs. This is above where they were in 1990. It's crazy. So it's really punitive for credit card debt. So you're going to get in a situation where it becomes harder and harder. And that's what worries me. That's what the solvency is. Also, we've seen something very interesting in the credit markets and the bond markets. We've seen an all-time high record issuance of bonds. Well, that's interesting because only people who can issue bonds, i.e. the best creditors, could do it. Anybody who needs a loan can't because the banks aren't lending. And we can see that from velocity of money as a way to show that money's not going around the system. Or we can see the senior loan officers survey, which has spiked to now all time highs. So they've tightened their lending standards ridiculously. But anyway, let me go one step back. I want to talk about that dichotomy. I want to focus on the bank side of the equation, not on the tech stocks. I'm less interested in those. I will come on to those at the end. But the bank stocks, what is that all about? Well, I've also been looking at the most indebted companies in the world. I constructed a GMI basket of triple B equities. Triple B, if you remember, it's kind of the largest pool of borrowings in the US now, and they're one step above junk. So those companies, the GEs and the AT&Ts and the Fords and the GMs of this world are generally old economy companies with high leverage, and they're suffering in this environment. Digital companies have been fine in this environment. They tend not to have debt, but these ones have debt. And if you look at the chart of the triple Bs versus the banks, they're roughly the same. But what's also interesting is that chart is roughly similar to the bond chart as well. So if I look at 10-year bond yields, it's roughly the same chart. They're all telling you the economy is slow. Remember, I always think bonds are the truth. They tend to have less noise and more economic reality. But when I look at emerging market foreign exchange, people have been going, look, the dollar's turned. But when I look at the emerging market foreign exchange index and compare that to the banks, that too is the same. So what we've got is a whole bunch of indicators that are about debt and they all look bad. The ones that have no debt, like the tech stocks, or the, or the gold miners, gold itself, or Bitcoin, things that are free of obligations have done extremely well. Things with obligations have done less well unless they're supported by the Fed, like the credit market overall. You see, what we're starting to see, and this is what the banks are picking up, and the bond market's picking up, and the triple Bs are picking up, is that corporate cash flows are impaired, household cash flows are impaired, small enterprises and medium-sized enterprises are all impaired. The rising NPLs are now becoming evident across the United States. Now, it's not filtering through yet to full bankruptcies, but that's coming because there's still some level of forbearance by the banks. But they're provisioning at record levels now because they know that wave is coming. 
If they know that's coming, they're going to lend less. So there's no way that the banks are going to lend. We've seen that in Europe this morning. This story is a global one, right? It's not just the US. In Europe this morning, as time of recording, which is Thursday, the Europeans gave $73 billion to the banks. And looking at the banks today, they were down 2%. The reason being is you can give the banks money, but they won't lend them. They've got structural problems and you've got the weaker creditors out there that are the real problem in the system. And I'll come a little bit onto that um, system globally. In fact, why not talk about it now? One of the things people talk about is the swap lines and, and those swap lines where the Fed lend money to the other central banks. Well, that helps. It helps with liquidity at central bank level and it helps liquidity at the bank's level. But beyond that, the actual borrowers of dollars offshore, the people who are in debt, are corporations. Sure, there's some sovereigns like Brazil and, and South Africa and others that have issues, but the corporates are the big problem. Now, the issue is, is things don't work anymore because a, a euro dollar, which is an offshore dollar, is not the same as an onshore dollar because regulation has meant that, let's say, Deutsche Bank in the US can't essentially borrow money from the Fed and give it to its other operations. It's kind of ring-fenced. Also, there's a restriction from regulation about the kind of lending practices that these banks in Europe can do, and same with Japanese banks, Basel III and stuff like that. So what happens is when money comes from the Fed to the ECB, and the ECB says, banks, here's some money, just make sure you've got enough liquidity, they shore up the liquidity for their needs and their most creditable customers, those who can pay their, their obligations. But what happens, it's a game of musical chairs. And those that can't pay or may not be able to pay don't get access to credit. So that money doesn't flow through the system at all. So the Fed is powerless to change this. The central banks are pretty much powerless to say to change it unless we change what targeted lending could be. And that's maybe something that will come. We've seen that in Japan in the past. We've seen it in China in the past. We've seen it in Southeast Asia in the past. But that's an issue that's real. So that doesn't work. But also, when we come to the micro level, the Yelp survey of businesses is showing that businesses in record numbers are closing forever. The high street or main street will never be the same again. Now, that doesn't mean that Main Street won't still have shops, but they're going to be different ones. There's a change of guard, and, and that's an opportunity for the young people of today, the millennial generation, to go out and create new businesses because old businesses have gone. So there is opportunity in all of this. It's just very hard to take advantage of it when you can't borrow any money and things are particularly difficult. But those opportunities will come. The creative destruction allows for some great chances of a new future for all of us. But again, we're still in the insolvency phase in my mind. That time thing is the part that really worries me because the time of negative GDP means that, as I said, small to medium sized enterprises who are most at risk will start closing, which is happening. They will start laying off more staff, which is happening. So that all goes up the food chain because people service those larger businesses, larger services businesses, larger providers service those small businesses. And slowly but surely, people start laying off staff. So we had the first layoff of staff. Then you get the people coming back into the workforce as these companies reopened. But now, as companies realize they can't pay their bills going forwards, you start to see the trickle effect and structural unemployment takes place. I think that is in process as we speak. Now that's really concerning because generally the people being laid off were the people who were involved in the speculation, the people who were given the $1,200. That speculative activity is likely to diminish because people are gonna start realizing, okay, this is not a temporary thing where I've been given a bunch of cash, I'm staying at home, isn't this cool, to, oh shit, I'm not gonna get a job, I don't know what to do, I can't pay my rent. Now, those people don't speculate. They also don't pay into their 401ks. Now, the 401k passive flows into index funds, particularly into NASDAQ-style funds, has been one of the things that's driven that market. I think that is potentially up for change too. 
So I think there's a structural change coming. The banks are telling us it. The bond market's telling us. Emerging market FX is telling us. And triple B equities are telling us. I think the gold versus bank spread is telling us. I think the price of gold and Bitcoin are telling us. So I think it's all there. And we're still in the transition phase from one hope phase, which took on speculation as well, and then transitioning into the insolvency phase. So up until recently, I kind of kept the equity markets off my screen because I just didn't want to get involved. But we started carving out what could be, could be in the key words, a potentially large top pattern. So I first noticed that the S&P had put in a weekly nine on DMARC, and we've been waiting for this to happen. So that tells us maybe something could change here. Then when I looked at the larger chart pattern, the monthly chart pattern, we had this big megaphone top. A megaphone top, should it occur, is usually a reversal pattern. Doesn't always happen that way, and we've been wrong-footed in the past, but it increases the probability. So we've got the S&P weekly D Mark 9, the megaphone top. Then I looked at the weekly RSI, and the divergence is astonishing. So we've now got divergence to add into that equation. And then I looked at the monthly divergence too. All of those things suggest that if we're going to find a top, it might be here. This is exactly the point where the Fed have stopped stimulating. It's exactly the point where most of the checks have stopped being mailed. It's exactly the point where the structural unemployment is starting to become a problem. It's exactly the point that the US election paralyzes parts of the system. That's interesting to me. It's interesting because we've got this gap, the gap of uncertainty, and that could be problematic. Now, if you go back to remembering the, the end of hope phases, it's that gap of uncertainty that starts it and then it builds on itself. And I think the underlying fundamentals are there. Now, I don't know for sure. I'm just giving you my hypothesis that seems to be playing out well. So that's okay. I mean, parts of my hypothesis have not played out so well. I mean, the dollar's been stronger than I expected and the stock markets have. I haven't been short the stock markets. I've been long the dollar and that's been painful. So, you know, I don't have any monopoly on the truth and I can be completely wrong as well. But I do think there's something changing. The bond market's trying to break yields lower. We've also seen that quantitative easing is being continued by the other central banks. But Europe's got a real problem. It can't do much more fiscal, even though it's got a second wave of virus that's big. And the Europeans will act in a different way. They won't probably lock down whole countries, but they will be more strict than the US has been in some places. So you're going to see further constraints to growth. And the Spanish are going to have problems with their banking system. The Italians too. All of these guys are going to have to struggle with restricted cash flows for longer. Only last week, Spain merged two of its banks, a basket case bank and another bank. We've seen that in the past. You just generally turn the other bank into a basket case too. But it just delays things. We've seen that whole process in Italy over time as well. But I'm worried about that rise of the virus in these countries. It's shut off the summer, which is one of the big GDP pipelines for these countries. And I think that the governments are hamstrung with their ability to fiscally stimulate because they have to get this mutualized version of a euro bond across, the European bond. And that's not clear that Holland or Austria or other harder line countries, Finland, will allow this to happen. So if you don't, Europe gets paralyzed too. In the UK, they've just talked about negative rates. Looks like that's coming. The two-year rates are already pricing it. Negative rates are pretty much spread across the world now. We've got them in the UK. We've got them in Switzerland. We've got them in Europe. We've got them in Japan. They've happened in, in New Zealand. Um, they're spreading. And I think they're coming to the US as part of the next phase as the insolvency starts to unveil. And I've always said the bond market, once it breaks up, you could take two-year yields, this beautiful chart of two-year yields. If it breaks 10 basis points, it's probably going to zero. If it breaks 10 basis points, it's telling you the economy has changed because bonds are the truth. And it's not driven by the central bank because they're not buying any. The, 
the, the central bank balance sheet has basically stopped expanding. Will that change with the Fed in some point soon? Of course it will. But this gap, this structural rigidity, we've got a change of leadership in Japan as well. I don't know what that means, but I don't think it's good. I don't think the US election's good, and I don't think the fights between China and the US are good. So my radar is up for maybe something changing. Maybe the alligator jaws of tech and the S&P versus the banks close. And maybe it closes with the outperformers meeting up with the underperformers. That's possible. I'm not sure. But the technical signals are in place. Now I'm looking for what I call the GMI crash pattern. There's one a smaller version of it playing out in front of our eyes today. And that's a market that falls sharply, rallies, maybe retraces 50%, sometimes as much as 61.8, even 75% of the fall, then rolls over again and takes out that low. The s and is trying to do it today at time of filming, as is the NASDAQ, which looks like it may have broken. But if I look at the magnitude of it, it still looks like a relatively small one. So it could be just a corrective move, something that I've been expecting but I think it could morph into something bigger. So let's ha- see how that develops. But I'm extremely concerned by, by the potential for this to unravel rather fast because, as you know, everybody's one side of the boat, and that side is V-shaped recovery and growth. When large parts of the market, including the truthiness of the bond markets, whispering at you, hey, that's not right, they're all going bust. And it's a global phenomenon, as I said before, South Korean corporates, it's South African corporates, it's in the UK, it's in Europe, it's in Japan, it's in China, it's everywhere. So this is a global phenomenon. And as global growth remains low, then this is going to get worse. Let's talk about vaccines for a sec as well. I don't, I'm not interested in your shit fight over what you think should happen over COVID. Let's deal with what is happening. What is happening is global growth is impinged by the restriction of economic movement. The hope is that the vaccine will come. And I explained a while ago that the U.S. administration is going to trump trump it um, that a vaccine is coming and they're going to try and do it by the election and they will launch something. The reality is, is there are not enough doses and it's small. Some of these large vaccine doses come from India India will not give two to 300 million doses to some other country without taking some for itself. There is a global shit fight to happen over vaccines, who's securing what, who's going to be allowed to. So the thing is going to roll out over time. Many of these vaccines require double inje- injections. So you need a massive, massive process of producing vaccines, then vaccinating people. And then you've got the anti vaccines You've got a number of things. Now, whether or not you think COVID is a serious deal, I'm not interested. I'm interested in what it means for for the economy and how it behaves. And if there is a fear, then travel doesn't come back and much of trade doesn't come back and people don't go to shops. People don't do the same thing. People don't go to music venues. There's whole chunks of the economy that just don't come back. So I'm not sure the vaccine is really the silver bullet that everybody expects. Over time, of course it will be. The other thing that's over time, of course it will be, is fiscal stimulus. Fiscal is going to be huge and not the kind of two, three trillion fiscal we're talking about. We're talking like five, 10 trillion massive fiscal structural change. I think it's more likely on a Democrat victory in the US. I think it's difficult in Europe under the current construct. But I think it's going to happen everywhere over time. And it's the central banks printing money to allow the governments to take massive action. Now, I'm actually quite bullish about that process because the last time that happened was after uh, the 1930s. And it actually, the New Deal did a lot of good and changed a lot of things. And it wasn't the inflationary pulse that everybody imagined. That didn't happen. Okay, there was a world war after that too. And, you know, who knows where this all goes? And I'm not sure that war is a made, made thing, but certainly geopolitical tensions are rising by the day. And maybe something happens with the US and China in a proxy thing in Taiwan or something else. I don't know. It depends how aggressive this get, gets. It depends who's in power. But that whole period is to come. And you can't get that through quickly. 
It's going to take real political alliance and a terrible economy to do it. If you try to launch a $10 trillion, $5 trillion, whatever the number is, choose your ludicrous number and double it, kind of fiscal stimulus. If you try to do that now, there'll be uproar because now people think that everything's okay. So you need to see more pain for that to happen. But I think it's coming. I think that I'm still in the deflationary camp. I understand many of you are in the inflationary camp. Maybe that's in the future. Again, I don't see that unless something structurally, fundamental, massively changes to offset demographics and technology, which I think are the two biggest drivers of deflation along with debt. Sure, a debt jubilee of some form helps. You know, We've talked about this. Maybe an end result is some sort of perpetual bond that never matures that could go on the central bank balance sheet or into the insurance companies or elsewhere where nobody ever has to pay it back and essentially gets rid of it. That's the kind of debt jubilee part of this. But we all know where this leads to. Even if the equity markets don't kind of close those alligator jaws, which I think is a possibility, not necessarily my base case, but I think there's a reasonable chance. But if they don't, knowing what we know about growth, I don't think I'm going to be wrong on that. I could be, but I think my probability is much lower. If growth is going to remain negative for longer and this insolvency phase grows, then we're going to see the central banks having to do more. First, they will do some more QE to try and do anything. But liquidity is not the answer. But hey, why not print some more currency? So everybody's doing it. And then the governments, particularly after the US election, will start talking about doing more fiscal. And we know that the only way they're really going to pay for it is by doing by putting it onto the central bank balance sheet in the end. I don't see any way out of a negative 5% ongoing contraction in GDP that has no magic bullet, that is not a healing process. It's structural for the time being. Of course, it will go in the end. But I'm worried that this goes on past the summer next year unless something happens and may maybe takes up the whole of the next year. I mean, recessions generally go on for two years and we've only just started. And I know it started steep, but it's come up and it's basically stopped. So if that's the case, then we're going to see more and more coming from the central banks and the governments. And that leads us into, okay, how do we play this? What does this mean for us? Well, again, I'm cautious. And again, there's a bunch of you who are baby boomers and I can't tell you how lucky you've been to see the markets do this. Now, unfortunately, your active portfolios have not done as well as the stock market because many of you over time have been sellers of active strategies, which you hold in your pensions, and rightly so. But they've been laggards because of it. So maybe you don't hold the NASDAQ, but if you do, you should be reducing risk. I get it. There's no returns in bonds. You have to deal with it. The only way of dealing with this is lowering your cost of living. And that's whether you move, which people are doing, or whether it's you think about supplementing income. But you need to think about this because this is very precarious. This is the most expensive stock market of all time. Does this keep going on forever? Very, very unlikely. The expected future rate of return of the equity market is negative, And the bond market's probably negative too. And the credit market's negative. So hell, what are you supposed to do? Just be careful. It's harder to help you guys because you're so close to retirement, but just protect yourself. Just do that one thing. I could be wrong, but you're not going to lose out by protecting and guaranteeing what your pension assets are. Now for others, the opportunity, I think, ends up being gold and Bitcoin. I don't buy into the dollar collapse argument, not yet. Sure, could the dollar weaken? Is it going to collapse? I don't think so. I think the Bank of England today, talking about negative rates, have proved why it's not going to happen. Everybody has to do the same thing. The world is not just about the US, guys. It's about everybody trying to protect themselves. And they all know the only answer they've got is printing more. There is no monetary policy left. So when we do that, when all of the currencies are continuing to do that, what you're losing is purchasing power of the currencies overall. 
call it the global fiat currency basket. And for GMI, I've held a long position for a significant period of time of a basket of 27 currencies, short versus long gold. And that trade plays out beautifully almost every day. And that's what's going on here. That's the best manifestation representation of this. However, I looked at the central bank balance sheet to see what's offset the growth in the G4 central bank balance sheets. Have we managed to offset it by owning equities? That's worked for periods, and it hasn't done bad. But the central bank balance sheet have outperformed the equity markets. What about gold? Surely that thing did, because that's what it's there to do. Well, oddly enough, it's underperformed by 50%. So it's not offset the amount of printing that's happened. So that's concerning, and most people don't realize that. And I think the Michael Saylor interview on Real Vision points out some of the reason why is that gold has some sort of excess supply, extra uh, ongoing supply that creates maybe some inability to match the central bank's balance sheet. I don't know, but it's just not done what we need. Maybe it plays catch up. Let's hope so, right? I'm long gold. But Bitcoin is the one really for me where I think the juice of this trade lies. I think it's the one of the world's best chart patterns is the massive wedge. I think that the stock to flow ratio has credibility to it and gives you a good opportunity to understand what might drive price. I think that knowing that we can front run every institution, this is a retail revolution driven from the ground up. And when we see that we retail investors are going to be ahead of the pension plans, the family offices, the corporate treasurers, um, and everybody else involved in the space. They're all coming. The RAAs, they're all coming. Wait till the Bitcoin ETF gets launched. Wait till it becomes easier to buy the products and find it easier for, for other people who are not involved in the space. It's going to suck more people in. The more it goes, people come in, the more the market cap goes up. The more the market cap goes up, the more it sucks people in. I think we're going to have a reflexive loop that is going to be enormous in this space. And it's coming and we get to front run it. And it's the world's hardest currency. It's the hardest currency we've ever had by any definition. And it's bloody easy to use and transfer around. So I really think that Bitcoin from every level looks like the best bet. But maybe you don't like it. And gold is fine too. I think bond yields is a trade. I think they'll go lower. But it's not the home run trade it was when we nailed it back with euro dollars or in March of this year, in kind of February to March of this year. But I think there's a trade there and that's OK. The dollar is complicated, as you know. And so if you don't have a position, I think I just steer clear of that chop fest right now. I think you could tentatively own some puts in the S&P. Volatility is not super high. And maybe that helps protect. That's not a bad bet. Put spreads. Always a nice way to play a trade like this until you're trying to establish, has the trend changed happened? I don't believe in the reflation argument. I don't like the idea of owning commodities. I'll change my mind if the dollar really does change. But I don't see that yet. So I don't find those of a hedge. So we're left with you know, a core group of things. I'm also short the US banks, the regional banks and others, and also um, I'm short General Electric and AT&T. And these aren't aggressive positions. These are kind of suck it and see, feel it. Am I right about the insolvency phase? They seem to trade like shit. So I feel like I'm right. I feel like the evidence is stacking up in my favor that I've got the right bet on. But we need to see the acceleration for that. So in answer to the question, has everything changed? I think it's changed in ways that most people don't yet understand. I think they're thinking, is this a new world where the equity market goes to all-time highs and it's affected by currency printing? I'm not sure that's the right narrative. I kind of think there's the underlying narrative and we're transitioning from hope to insolvency. Just remember, if you look at this last chart, this is the rally now versus the rally in 1929. It kind of peaked out around these levels and this time. Also, there was a secondary rally in 2001 into 2002, and I remember it well. I was at GLG trading it at the time. That was the hope phase rally of that. There was an earlier hope phase back in 2001 as well. 
And that one peaked out after about six months. So the timing's around here. So be careful, keep your eyes open. I think the unfolding is still unfolding and the insolvency phase is to come. What's gonna be fascinating over the next two weeks now is just seeing what other people think, what structural changes, real changes. Outside of my framework, there's plenty of other things going on. And I wanna know what's really changed. And I think you guys need to truly focus on this because as I said, this is gonna affect your pension, your job, your business, and your investment portfolio. It can't be more important. Anyway, I wish you the best. Good luck, and I hope you enjoy what's coming up over the next two weeks. If you like what you see on our YouTube channel, you can unlock everything that Real Vision has to offer from expert analysis, in-depth reports, education, and more to help you understand finance, business, and the global economy. You can get all that and more for just $1 for 30 days.